well, perfectly. What made them more equal is that I was writing about Anne Lister at a point where we have actually very little information about her. Okay. Because she hadn't started the diary yet. Um, there are maybe one or two letters that she writes as a child to, to um, her relatives. But we all, yeah, we know very little about her then. Okay, so and there was just so much. To the Harbour Grace excursion with the boys to have a time. Okay, learned by heart. Has I, I just wanted to gauge before we get started. It's come out very recently, and I'm going to assume that most people haven't had a chance to read it yet. Okay, so uh, we'll, we'll be careful to uh, not spoil any plots. Um, but I did want to talk a little bit about the book. Um, it's a story set in um, York in 1805. And it's about two girls. Um, the first, Eliza Rain, is uh, orphaned Harris from um, India, from Madras. And she's at the school, and she gets a new roommate, a formidable tomboy named Tom Lister. Or, sorry, Ann Lister. Um, I won't thump my chest <laughs> anymore. Um, and this is a story. It's a love story. It's full of passion. Um, it's romantic, it has the most rich historical detail, which I'm sure if you've read Emma's books in the past won't surprise you. I had the most wonderful experience reading it. I um, curled up with it on a weekend. And it just, it was one of those, from the very first sentence, you realize you're in the very best hands and you're on a journey. And I got to live in York in um, 1805 with all these um, sensual details and uh, wonderful plot points. Um, and it just, it, it was an absolute journey and a pleasure. So I'm very excited for those of you that still have it ahead of you. Um, okay, so I thought we'd talk a little bit first about the inspiration and the extensive research that Emma did. And then she's going to do a short reading and then we'll get more into the specifics of the book, if that sounds Good to everyone, and uh, I won't thump my chest. I just <laughs> nearly did it again. I d didn't realize that was a thing. But um, and then we'll have questions at the end. Um, okay, um, Emma, I'd like to ask you first about the research. Um, Anne Lister, one of the two main characters, changed your life. Can you tell me a bit about that? I went into a bookshop um, to escape a rainstorm in England when I was about 20, and I'm 53 now. So this is going back a long time. And I came across, Virago Press had just published the first book of excerpts from the diaries of this extraordinary Yorkshire woman called Anne Lister. And the Anne Lister diaries have been described as the longest diary in the English language. About 15% of them um, is in a secret code that Anne Lister devised of numbers and um, Greek and Roman lettering. Um, she was that kind of self-educated show-off, you know? <laughs> um, and um, she, she frankly recorded everything, you know, uh, how far she walked, um, what mending she did on her clothes, what her sister said, you know, social spats and subtleties, and also her raging affairs with a dozen different women in Yorkshire over the course of her career. <laughs> and because of this, um, the Anne Lister Diaries, instead of by now having been published in some reverential university press edition in many volumes, as you might expect, say, the Peeps Diary was, or Hor Horace Walpole's letters, um, instead of this, uh, they remain mostly unpublished. Um, so I've been banging on about her for about 30 years. Like, you should have heard of this extraordinary woman. And um, I, I actually wrote about her back in, the, back in the early 90s. I wrote my first play as a very free adaptation of this, this first book of, of diaries, which was called I Know My Own Heart. And so I thought, OK, I'm, I'm officially finished with her. Um, I don't usually go back. But I always remained fascinated by her very first love affair at boarding school in the other York um, in 1805. But so little was known about it because it was before any of the diaries, it was before any surviving letters of theirs, and almost nothing was known about the other girl, Eliza Rain, who was um, this, very, this very piquant combination of qualities in that she was one of the only brown people in York at the time, 
and yet she was an heiress with a fortune in the bank and famously beautiful. So lots of social you know, pros and social cons. And similarly, Anne Lister was this eccentric, not particularly pretty, badly dressed um, tomboy, and yet incredibly intellectually confident and um, confident about her place as sort of from a, a good Yorkshire family. So these two oddballs happened to be assigned to the same um, attic room. It was the only room with just two girls in it, a room called the Slope. And we know that because um, um, Eliza Rain, like, like I would say, nervous girls always have. She kept a little chart of who was who at school. She did this in two of her schools. We have a little list of who was in her London school and then a list of who was in her Yorkshire school. And that is an example of one of the sources I found so rich because it told me not just the facts of who slept where in the school, but it told me that Eliza had needed to record this. So I knew that she was a kind of watchful, nervous of her social position, keeping tabs on things. Uh, so very often a source will, will tell you something by its existence as well as something else by its content. Um, something else I have to say about the sources is I usually pride myself on you know, doing all my own work, but in this case, I couldn't. I was writing this novel during COVID when I was you know, very far from Yorkshire and unable to get to the archives. And also, I don't really have any skill at reading a 19th century handwriting. And by now, by the time I was finally writing this novel, um, the Anne Lister fandom, stimulated by the TV show Gentleman Jack on HBO and BBC, hundreds of them had volunteered to transcribe these diaries. So a rough transcription of most of the diaries was available, but the letters between Anne Lister and Eliza Rain, the surviving letters, hadn't been. So basically I asked for help and 14 women transcribed the letters for me um, as, as a pure gift. You know, so so many people helped me. Oh, that's amazing. Somebody I reached out to on Twitter wrote back, and I plagued her. She's a sort of genealogical researcher. I plagued her with queries over the course of a full year during lockdown, <laughs> and she managed to find me details about many of the girls in in the school who were the same age as Anna and Eliza, and about their teachers and so on. So this novel is as near as wow. any of mine are to being crowdsourced. Yeah. <laughs> I'm hugely grateful. That's amazing. And so you were writing during lockdown and not able to go to the archives. Exactly. Is, it, is that where Lister, I'm going to call yeah, them the Lister Yeah, the Lister Diaries, and yeah. Anne, Anne Lister's Diaries are uh, the whole set of little volumes. Um, they are in uh, the diaries in, in uh, Halifax in Yorkshire. Yeah. Oh, okay. But really, I, I needed help even if I had been able to go to the, the archives because, as I say, you know, puzzling out her handwriting is, is almost as difficult as the, as the code. Right. So I got such a help from this, this huge community which has sprung up around Anne Lister. And you know, usually, usually they're the scholars and then maybe TV people who, who sort of exploit the story as it were, and then the fandom who wait passively for the story. But in the case of Anne Lister, it's not like that. It's all one community because say Sally Wainwright, the amazing showrunner and scriptwriter of Gentleman Jack, she won a big screenwriting award and she spent the money having the diaries digitized. Uh -huh. And then, as I say, hundreds and hundreds of the fans signed up to transcribe the digitized copies. So it's this amazing virtuous feedback loop in which everybody's helping to get um, the texts about Anne Lister and her dozen lovers into the light, as it were. So, so you know, it, it erases the usual distinctions between, you know, scholars and fans, for ah. instance. So the people who were transcribing weren't necessarily at the archives either. They were no, working they, from digital. They were working from so this scans. Is a, this is a very internet era my goodness. Um, form of collaboration. And a lot of them don't have a literary or historical background. A lot of them are really techies, you know. Um, so it's been, it's been a fascinating mixture. But and they can read cursive. Yeah, they've trained themselves <laughs> Which to. is almost a lost art, I, know. I hear. <laughs> we both have teenagers, and yeah, there's not a lot of cursive. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, you know, I've been working on this novel so long, but actually I'm glad I didn't write it any earlier because mm. the, the help available to me just in the last maybe three years in terms of other people researching this stuff um, and in terms of international sort of collaboration, it wouldn't have been available to me earlier. And so I, I was able to find out much more about Eliza Rain, but also about others in the school. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. Um, and who, so who was responsible for keeping her diaries in the first place? Because so often we lose this kind of Indeed. vital well, history. Indeed. Well, this is why we have Anne Lister's papers, because she was lucky enough to inherit a stately home from her uncle and her aunt. They were both single, and they seem to have left it to their 
obviously lesbian daughter, thinking, well, at least she's not going to marry and take the property out of the family. <laughs> you know? so, um, so she was, you know, rich enough that her, her stuff was preserved. So any letters of Eliza Rains we have, just because they're mixed in with the huge oh, Lister dear. archive, nothing of Eliza's was saved. Eliza, who once had, you know, hampers of diamonds and so on, nothing remained. So um, they, they couldn't be more contrasting in that way. And even though Anne Lister, you know, has, has attracted such attention, and I thought half the novel would be her, I thought I would divide it between the two girls in terms of perspective. But once I started to actually draft it, and um, Eliza Raines sort of grabbed the mic, as it were, I found everything from her point of view was more interesting because she was the one who's been left out of the story, the, the, the silent one, the one who was not recorded, the one who didn't become famous, the one who didn't have this, this whole future career, which included you know, writing five million words of diary. So I suppose novelists are often drawn to the, the untold part yes, of the story. Uh, yes. So yes, it ended up being Eliza Raines' book. Did you say five million yes, words? <laughs> yes, Anne Lister had an obsessive quality. Everything she did, she did a lot of. <laughs> Women, <laughs> walking, <laughs> coal mines, travel. She was you know, the first woman to climb various mountains. She had this vast energy and it's a vast diary. And I'm just so grateful that because she was so honest in her diary, we, we know a lot about um, not just her life, but the lives of all those involved with her. Wow. So there was a moment you turned back to her. Was there, you know, one particular spark that when you were thinking of what you were going to write next that? No, I, in, the, in the back of my mind since about the late 90s, I'd been right. thinking one of these days I'll do a novel about Anne Lister and Eliza Rain. But it was partly a hesitation about how I would approach it mm. and which bit of their lives I would show. You know, it's very often about deciding how much to include in the frame, as it were. And I decided ultimately that I don't want to spoil anything, but Eliza had a pretty sad future life, and I didn't want to completely ignore that, but nor did I want the novel to be weighed down by long decades of, of suffering. So I decided that I would make it strictly a sort of boarding school novel, in that I would set it over one, the one year they spent at school together, but that I would also have letters from Eliza 10 years later, speaking from that, that more painful future era. And I knew that that would give me a built-in sort of nostalgic theme mm -hmm. to the novel because it's all about Eliza remembering you know the one glorious year she had in which she herself in her letters talked about you know the city of York was where my son rose and where it set and and it made me think a lot about the very universal part of this novel which is everybody remembers the first time they fell in love mm -hmm. everybody remembers the one who got away you know I'll never forget falling in love at 14 Sometimes I think you feel more vividly then than you ever will again. Um, so, so I really tried to put into the novel lots of autobiographical material about that feeling of, I'm 14, I've never felt this before. You know, this is either destroying my life or is the source of all my happiness, I can't quite tell. <laughs> <laughs> That's accurate, <laughs> I, I remember that. Um, <laughs> It's sort of, oh, oh no, I'm doing my, <laughs> I did, I, it's obviously quite a thing with me. I've never had it pointed out. Um, but I, you mentioned the codes briefly. So they wrote to each other in code. The letters aren't in code, but um, uh, each of them, Eliza too kept a diary for a short time in around, okay. around 1809, and she used some code words too. So they, they, they seem to have overlapped in their use of code. And um, it's been suggested that Eliza may have helped Anne develop the code. But Anne was such a sort of, you know, supercharged in intellectual. Um, I, I would imagine she probably made it up herself. But she certainly shared her code with various of her lovers. And the code was yet another sort of secret they had between them, you know. And so you worked with code breakers as well, um, which <laughs> yes, sounds yes, like a novel in itself. It's true. It's true. And, <laughs> We owe everything to Helena Whitbread, who's in her 80s now, and she's the one who published that first volume of selections called I Know My Own Heart. And she's been working on the Anne Lister material ever since. And she has welcomed these new generations of Anne Lister scholars and Anne Lister fans. And you might expect she'd be sort of gatekeeping, not a bit. She's just embraced the whole community. Um, so so it's, been, it's been an amazing experience of, of, of shared enthusiasts, uh, you know, sharing all their information. People send me their, you know, 
unpublished um, um, research and so on, people shared so much with me. Um, I think because, you know, we're all, those of us who have discovered Anne Lister are just so enthusiastic to get the world talking about her. But I found myself more and more fascinated by Eliza Rain because um, she was just in such a strange position being this, you know, rich girl and yet very isolated. Um, her father, she, she grew up in Madras and her father, her British father, took her away from her Indian mother at the age of six, sent her off on the boat to England, um, you know, the homeland, even though she'd never been there, and with no plans for her to go back. And she and her sister, who she didn't get on with, they were just sent off to be, to be Englished, as it were. And um, she was, they were entirely cut off from their Indian family. We don't know a thing about her mother. We don't even know what religion her mother was or what ethnic group or her name. Her mother just shows up in the sources as Dr. Rain's woman, and it says what pension she got. But then she died and the father died, so Eliza and Jane found themselves in England just, you know, absolutely cut off from, from their Indian childhood. So she's, Eliza's really deracinated, and I found that a very fascinating kind of experience to write about, because really in, in every practical way she was English, and yet every time white English people looked at her, you know, they, they othered her. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it was a... This is one reason the novel took me so long to write, is that, you know, I, I really doubted whether I could get it right about Eliza, you know? Would you like to read us sure. a short passage, and then we'll sure. get more into Eliza? Here is that antique hodgepodge King's Manor hiding our school behind its red brick face. The great medieval door with its lion and unicorn opens at my touch, and I find myself in the scented courtyard. I turn right to enter the manor school itself, where three generations of one family have watched over the better-born daughters of the north. I walk invisible from one familiar ramshackle room to the next, through the kitchen and pantry, refectory and offices, and up the foot-worn stone stairs I float, through the classrooms on the first floor, into the north wing, past the mistress's chambers, up again to the second floor attic, past cook's room, then the one the four maids share, and then the box room full of trunks and portmanteaus. The fourth door is the slopes and it springs open to my fingertips. You'll understand my wishful fancy. I pay this visit, in fact, all these tender nightly visits in my mind's eye only. In the flesh, I have not passed the lion and unicorn and entered our manor school in eight years. These days, of course, I am prevented, thwarted by circumstances beyond my control but last year, or in any of the intervening years since I left, though I often passed the lovely old silhouette of King's Manor, somehow careless, unthinking, I never thought to knock on that ancient door. Eliza, I ask myself now, why didn't you go back while you still could? You won't be surprised that I so treasure these old haunts. It was in York that I received my education, where I was stamped like warm wax by a seal formed once and for all. I know you'll recall the song we used to sing, where all the joy and mirth made this town heaven on earth. Well, at the manor school, I tasted heaven on earth even as I toiled to pack my poor skull with the knowledge and wisdom I was told I would need for life. The joke is, Lister, the only lesson I learned, or at least the only lesson I remember, was you. We too were so young, we had barely seen the change of 14 years, as Capulet says of his daughter. Less than a 12 month, the pair of us spent under our slope slanted ceiling. But there are fleeting times in life, especially in youth, that shine out more strongly than all the rest and will never fade. Veins of gold in dull rock. For the rest of my life, I believe, I will be transported back in dreams to memory's private theater, where our girl selves still move Still chat, still laugh. I'll leave that there, thank you. I'm glad you chose Eliza. <laughs> She's such a beautiful voice. Um, can you tell me about the first line? Last night it's I went to It's a shout out to Rebecca. Camp. Yeah. Sometimes I think you should, you know, pay homage to your um, inspirations by, you know, overtly echoing them. And then it's such fun when the occasional reader gets it, you know. <laughs> Um, 
Yeah, I suppose Rebecca as a novel, that's one of the last novels I got to read my kid before she got too busy for me to read to her. It lasted until 15. <laughs> the last one I read her was uh, Jumper Lahiri's The Namesakes. We were, oh, you ended you know, well. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I didn't have to end on those terrible, you know, books aimed at 12-year-olds. Yeah. <laughs> that can be so bland. You know? um, but anyway, yeah, Rebecca as a novel is just dripping with nostalgia, even though, you know, when you're reading Rebecca, you realize plenty of painful things happened while the heroine was at Manderley, and yet somehow as a place, she can never get over it. It's, it's the lost domain. Um, to name check, another French novel I read in my teens, which is so full of nostalgia, um, Alain Fournier's The Lost Domain. Um, so um, yeah, I think every book is made of other books, and um, that's why I love doing readings in libraries, because this is where they all begin, really. This is the great primordial soup, you know? Mm -hmm. Especially every book you read before 20, uh, I think, affects you so much. Um, so, so yeah, Rebecca is just one of the, the many books that left its mark on this one. Jane Eyre certainly did, um, Charlotte Bronte's Villette. Um, um, also, say, a novel like um, A Separate Piece is one of the best boys' school books I know. Um, it's, it's brilliant in that the boys are about to go to war. They haven't gone yet, but it's like what goes on between them at school is like a war novel in miniature, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so, yeah, it's, it's nice to be able to sort of, you know, show your gratitude to other, to other authors. Did you go to boarding school? Never. <laughs> but um, I just went to, you know, convent day schools in Dublin, um, which sometimes people think that's very exotic, convent schools. And I say, <laughs> the Irish state just couldn't afford to set up a whole new system of, of secular schools. <laughs> They've just made use of the nuns and the brothers. Um, but my partner went to boarding school, um, and she's always talked about the very special culture of boarding school, which has always held a place for, for same-sex love without making it official. So mm -hmm. say at her boarding school in England in the 70s, uh, you could ask an older girl if she would be your pash, like your official passion. You know, this was a legitimate thing. You'd say, <laughs> will you be my pash? You know, so, so it's a strange little culture of its own, I think, boarding school. And one thing I liked was the idea of studying life in, in an institution mm -hmm. where um, it, it seemed to sort of provide a great way of containing the, the feelings of adolescence. You know, the idea that these girls are feeling these intense things for the first time ever. And because they're falling for each other, they're each thinking like, am I the first in the world who has felt this? <laughs> and yet they're feeling all this within this strict schedule of, you know, if you don't get your French lesson memorized, then you'll be given two more to memorize by tomorrow. So, you know, some girls are 20 lessons in debt. They'll never catch up. I didn't know what the rules of this particular boarding school were. So I read everything I could find, memoirs of other girls boarding schools at the time and I sort of you know chose my favorite um, rules from each of them because there were a lot of rules. Mm -hmm. In girls schools they didn't beat them but they used an elaborate system of sort of social control and surveillance. You'd, you'd get a demerit for something like standing too near the window so a boy might see you or you know greeting a man in the street who wasn't your cousin um, <laughs> and you'd get um, if you took three slices of bread then at the next meal you could only have one and the only way to get food it's, this was fairly standard at the time, was to offer it mm. in a sort of manipulative way, like, would you like yes. some tomatoes? <laughs> and you'd say, no, no, but can I help you to tomatoes? <laughs> so it's, I mean, we think of Regency society as very rule-bound anyway, and so boarding school is like this bizarre, very low-stakes version of that, where, you know, every Saturday they had judgment and consequences, and they would have to stand up and list their their demerits, and they could offset them with some of their merits. Um, this system, again, lasted, um, you know, my partner at her boarding school um, used to have to stand up and, you know, say anything, any sort of infractions she'd committed that week. Um, so it is funny how, oh how it's quite a timeless culture, you know? Yeah, it rang true. My grandmother was at an English yeah. boarding school, and it rang true. Um, it, and also the politics. Like, that's what was so wonderful. It was this closed world. And as a reader, you come into this. It, the, the girls have such a rich, rich political life. and there's, Well, they're all terrified the French are about to invade. <laughs> because the paradox at the time was, you know, Anne Lister longed to travel. And she and Eliza wrote to each other saying, like, oh, someday we'll go to Italy together. We'll travel on Eliza's money. We'll live free. But nobody was able to go to Europe during this long stretch of the Napoleonic Wars in which France was, you know, the enemy. They were terrified that a, a tr that a whole army of hot air balloons would come and land um, in England. Um, and yet, French was the high status language, the language of 
everything glamorous, everything important. So they were all, you know, English schools at the time used to boast teaching done half through French or entirely through French. So it was the, it was the high status language, um, and yet the French were the enemy. So I thought that was a, a good way of bringing up some of these issues about sort of, you know, the us group versus the other. Mm. Um, and, um, and, uh, and, and sort of colonial issues as well. Um, I decided yeah, novels set in the past um, about racism are often fairly heavy handed. You know, and I mean, obviously, if you're writing about something like cotton picking, there's no subtle way of, of playing it at all. Um, but I thought it could be more interesting in this case to look at all the what we now call microaggressions. So I decided I would make Eliza's um, headmistress and her sister, who ran the school, kind of, you know, um, what's the word, like virtue signaling liberals. So there's a really squirmy scene where they invite her to tea and they boast of the fact that they pay extra to have slavery-free sugar. And they've got, you know, a, an anti-slavery teapot and Eliza's just like, <laughs> don't make me sit through this conversation. Um, so, so yeah, I wanted to show that, that racism was always just bubbling way under the surface. Um, because one sort of interpretation of Eliza's life and the fact that she had a very, um, miserable fate is that, you know, that the strain of being the, the beautiful posh young lady, but also the, the racialized other, that that strain was just too much for her. And, and in all the letters of her social circle, nobody mentions race at all. And Eliza only mentions it once. She calls herself a young lady of color. But then there's a moment where she fights with her guardians and suddenly there are a little cluster of letters um, by one of her guardians' friends which are overtly, foully racist about Eliza. So it's as if all that was just, was just waiting to bubble up the first time Eliza put a foot wrong, you know? It, um, and there's moments in the book when she experiences, uh, you know, something that verges on physical fear but no one else sees it. It's very effective, I think. And how did you... How did you develop that side of her character? Well, one thing I always do for historical fiction is I read lots of contemporary sources as well. So I was puzzling a lot over, basically Eliza had a, a breakdown in her 20s, and I was puzzling a lot over issues of mental health and racism. And I remember there was a, there was a big article, I think in the Globe and Mail, about how schizophrenia rates seem to, um, um, in many places, correlate with living surrounded by, um, where, where your group are a, a tiny minority within a, a racist culture. So it's, it's not that being from any one group seems to correlate with these high schizophrenia rates. It's the, it's the isolation, it's the, it's the ghettoization. So I remember thinking, this makes sense of Eliza. That there she is in York thinking, you know, do they hate me? Do they assume the worst about me? Do they despise me? You know, like she, she knew what the cliches were about, you know, the, the Asiatic temperament, as people would have put it then. And so even if people were being nice to her, she was always thinking, do they mean it? What are they really thinking? You know, that kind of maddening self-consciousness, I thought, was, was one of the many factors that, mm. that pressed really hard on her. Mm -hmm. you know? So I suppose what I mean is that I don't just read sources from the time. I, I sort of brainstorm and, and look for insight wherever I can get it to, to answer the questions that I have when I'm writing a novel. Yeah, because you're writing for people now, aren't you? Exactly. And that, yes. <laughs> yeah, and, and many issues would be more overtly discussed now, you know. Um, yeah. Yeah. Hopefully, it's it's funny. It's um, it's not necessarily linear, is it? And I thought, oh, yeah. Progress? No. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. <laughs> it's true. Um, I mean, I would say, you know, if if Eliza had been living 50 years later, things would probably have been more overtly racist. Um, in her day, it was slightly like, oh, here's a, an exotic one-off, mm. you know, someone unusual. And, and one of the themes that the novel sort of broods over is whether it's a, a burden or, or quite fun to be um, a rarity. Um, and Anne Lister was quite ahead of her time in being proud of being different. You know, in her diaries, she says things like, I believe I'm made like no one in the world. Um, at one point, she says she's maybe the connecting link between the two genders or that nature was in an odd mood the day she made me. And, but, you know, only a girl who was incredibly confident about her intelligence and her desirability would be able to joke about that kind of stuff. If you're being made to feel truly unwanted in your culture, you're not saying, oh, I'm an amazing rarity. You're saying, I want to blend in. Mm. So, so, yeah, I thought a lot about the kind of ups and downs of, of identity and being, being a, an exoticized other, you know? And that's, that's the main reason I finally decided to make Eliza the point of view character, because obviously there are pitfalls both ways. 
Um, I, there was my worry about could I get her voice right, could I get her psychology right, but I thought if she's not my point of view character, then I'm treating her like the exoticized other myself. I'm, I'm you know, keeping Anne Lester's perspective and having Eliza be the unknowable. So I thought at a certain point, I find the Eliza stuff more interesting, so that just has to, That's wonderful. Has to come center. Mm -hmm. And interest is often it, isn't it? Yeah. It's what keeps you going. Yeah. Um, so on one hand, you had volumes from Ann Lister, and then you had very little from yeah. Eliza. So a couple of dozen letters, um, t a short bit of a diary. But her letters are very revealing. Um, like they're they're very they're interestingly moody. There are letters in which Eliza sounds, you know a bit full of herself. She'll say something like, oh, everybody copies the way I wear a black ribbon in my hair. Or, you know, the people around here have seen no one as exotic as me, I'm like a butterfly. And then in the next letter, she'll be saying, well, you know, if I don't live through the winter with my bad chest, who'd care really? So a real volatility. Okay. And I found that hugely helpful because even though that, these letters are from when she's in her early 20s, um, they still gave me the sort of flavor of her. And I would say a yeah. kind of, a certain vulnerability and an, an emotional up and down quality was, was what I got from them, as well as lots of tiny little details. Um, like, you know, she liked sweets and cakes and so on. We know that. Um, <laughs> and um, uh, we know things like um, particular songs she loved or books she loved. Or, yeah. So, so much of this book is about how those two characters fit together. Um, and it's, they're such formidable characters, both of them, and it's quite, it's, amazing, uh, there's so much power in it. If you had so much information about um, Anne and not as much about Eliza, did you stray from the historical record or how did you get them to fit so well, perfectly? What made them more equal is that I was writing about Anne Lister at a point where we have actually very little information about her. Okay. Because she hadn't started the diary yet. Um, there are maybe one or two letters that she writes as a child to, to um, her relatives. But we, all, yeah, we know very little about her then. Okay. So in a way, I was extrapolating backwards. I was saying, given the, what we know about Anne Lister in her late 20s, 30s, and 40s, what might she have been like at 14? Okay. But I didn't have like you know blow by blow descriptions of how she was spending her days. And I was free to imagine that, say, she ended up as a, a, a zealous Tory. She didn't have a vote, of course, but she used to march around and strong arm her tenants into voting for the Tory party. <laughs> and she and her, her last partner, Anne Walker, got so unpopular for this political meddling that they were burned in effigy. Um, so, you know, so, so she was a high Tory by then, but many people are not high Tories at 14, especially if they're, you know, not yet landowners and if they've fallen madly in love with their bi biracial roommate. So I decided that she would, you know, not be such a sort of hardened conservative, mm -hmm. for instance. Yes. Um, <laughs> as for Eliza, it's funny, you would usually just do wholesale invention of what you don't know, but because the research is so ongoing, like any day now somebody might find out who Eliza Rain's mother was. Right. So I really tried to write this novel in such a way that I wasn't inventing a lot about what's lost. I decided it was plausible that Eliza, having been yanked away at six and never, never had her Indian family spoken of to her after that, that really her memories are very are very lacking. So I, I you know the bits I put in about India I tried to make very evocative, but it's not a lot of information because mm. she has been so thoroughly, you know, ripped away from all that. Um, so yeah, I think that I, I think the trick was setting it so early on that really uh, I, I had to fictionalize both of them fully. Um, it would be much harder to do if you were writing about Anne Lister at a point where where we do have her diaries. You know? Though some, some writers are just so good at taking an over-documented situation and still making it fresh, like the late, great Hilary Mantel, mm. how she managed to take, you know, negotiations with Anne Boleyn over the, the divorce. You know, that has been so written about, so many sources, and yet she made it seem brand new. So, you know, writers who are good, good enough can do anything. <laughs> um, and the details, too, um, you get into things like what the sheets feel like. You must have done more than reading. I feel there was some... Well, mostly reading, but um, some, some hands-on stuff is always helpful. Like, I love in museums when they do, um, you know, they, they make copies of things that you can touch. Mm -hmm. you know, I'll never forget, um, before I wrote my first historical novel, I got to try on an 18th century corset, and I realized, oh, this isn't some kind of sexy undergarment at all. This is like armor. 
It was like rock oh, hard. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, the tactile experiences are helpful. So in this case, going around King's Manor, okay. um, the building, the sort of collection of medieval and, and 17th century buildings, it's still there in York. It's now the center for 18th century studies. And going around there with um, a, a, an architectural historian walked around with me and he'd point out little details and he'd say like, I think the refectory must have been here and look at the drain pipe. And, it was wonderful, um, and say so there's a there's an old Roman tower on the property, and I remember sort of poking around in there, and and there's an old and um, there's an old stone with a, a Roman saying on it. Put that straight into the book. Yeah. So yeah, or, and and in the streets of York again, lots of tiny little details. Um, so so yes, you know you, when you're trying to access the past, there are a number of routes there. Um, it does, and it does. It's a novel where you feel you can feel what it's like to put your foot down in the room where they are. And this, yeah, it's amazing how you caught that. And there are so many sources available now that weren't 10, 15 years ago. Um, so, for instance, the, of their of their classmates, um, between me and this genealogist San Ricken, who who was helping me out on Twitter, you know, we found details like you know one of them fell off a cliff as a small child and her nanny was killed and she, the girl, was hers. And that was just enough to give me, to mm. give me an idea of her. One of the girls, her father died during the term. Um, one of the girls, uh, like Eliza, was illegitimate but had money. Uh, and then one of the teachers, again, I would never have thought to invent this, but San Ricken found me a single letter preserved of one of their teachers, Miss Lewin, um, in which she describes um, to her friend, Arthur Murphy, the Irish playwright, uh, she describes coming north with her woman partner, basically. She says, you know, myself and Mrs. Morris moved up from London when I got this job. And I was like, oh my God, they have a teacher in a lesbian relationship. I would not have invented this. I would have thought that's a bit on the nose, as they say in TV. <laughs> but there we go. She existed. And she talks about the building and how there's a pig living in one of the downstairs rooms. Again, <laughs> I would not have invented a full-size pig living in one of the classrooms, but I was delighted to find it. <laughs> I mean, history is just so much odder than you could invent. This is why I keep going back to it for mm -hmm. inspiration. Now, you write, you're one of a handful who can do um, contemporary and historical novels so well. Do you, when you're, do you have a mood or how do you? It's just a it particular just a story I get drawn to. Right. And um, the contemporary ones are sometimes more autobiographical in, in what prompts them, like um, let's see, a recent one akin. Uh, I spent two separate years in Nice, so, so that novel very much grew out of that place. Um, and, but say, Room didn't have any autobiographical side except that you know, um, I, was, I had two small children. Um, so, so they come from a variety of sources, and I suppose I try and space them out so I don't have you know, two 18th century ones in a row. Um, um, but I just, they, they each scratch a different itch. Mm -hmm. I find it easier to be funny in contemporary fiction because shared cultural references. Um, but I, I love the high stakes elements of the past. You know, back before there was a welfare state, I'm sorry to sound so cruel, but you know, for a writer, it's great that if your main character makes one mistake, they could literally starve in the gutter. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so yes, I would hate to give up either, you know? And then you've also been writing um, screenplays. Yeah, and, you're working and on a play. theater. Yeah, so so I love those forms in particular. I notice I'm not getting any time to write short stories these days, and so I think probably my short story time has been eaten up by but. by film and and, t and 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 theater. And you know, a, a, a sad fact about screenplay writing is that many film and TV projects, you know, they look so hopeful and they never get made. So like most people, I have half a dozen projects that are dead on the vine, as it were. But then when they do get made, it is such fun and your friends get so much more excited about <laughs> you being at a party with Florence Pugh than they ever did about publishing books. <laughs> Plain old novelist. Do you think of yourself as a novelist first? Yes, if I had to pick. Yeah. That would be um, I suppose because the novel is, is, gives you maximum autonomy and power. You get to pick all the words. That's it, isn't it? Create your own little world. But I love adaptation and I love the collaborative aspect of it. I love the, the kind of extra kind of, you know, um, um, what's the word? You know, when your car won't start and a neighbor comes over with, a, with, with the wire. Phew. So it's like that. Somebody, you know, <laughs> adds an extra spark to your work and they see it differently. Mm -hmm. And even the arguments you have with them, even the terrible battles, which, you know, the viewers will never notice, but there you are thinking everything hinges on whether you get your way about scene 57. <laughs> you know? 
but even the, even the arguments are enjoyable because you're, you all care so much about making a good film or making a good play. Um, actually, theater is kind of the sweet spot because it's collaborative, but still everybody lets the playwright pick the words, so they're very respectful. So you kind of have maximum power in a sociable setting, um, <laughs> whereas in the film world, you really don't have the power. We, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, and if you weren't a writer, what would you be? I Honestly, I hate to sound mystical about this, but there is no... Emma, who isn't a writer. Mm. It, it's so yeah. thoroughly soaked into me. It's all I've ever done. It's the only skill I have. I was sacked as a chambermaid. You know? <laughs> I have no other marketable skills. Um, so I, it really- Why did a, you get sacked? You didn't, weren't doing the corners? Or the <laughs> to quote my boss, poor hygiene standards. Not personal hygiene, but the bathrooms <laughs> were imperfect. Yeah. 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 Um, and what, I think we're going to go to questions in Be preparing a your moment. great questions, so, okay? Yes, that's, have a think. But I'd like to know what you are reading or what you've read recently that ooh, struck you. Ooh. Um, let me see. Um, I just read a very brilliant Irish novel that'll be out um, in the spring called The Amendments, which is such a brilliant title because mm. right through my, my, my youth, we were constantly voting on amendments to our own constitution about abortion, about... Um, divorce, and then more recently, same-sex marriage. So Ireland goes through this agonizing kind of exercise every now and then of amending its constitution. So this novel is called The Amendments by Niamh Mulvey. Very brilliant. And one of the great pleasures of being a writer is when you get sent um, books in advance of publication uh, in order to puff them. And um, it's just such a sort of thrill of seeing books before the rest of the world does. But in terms of books I've read myself recently, um, I loved Anne Patchett's Tom Lake, mm. for instance. I listened to that on audiobook with um, Meryl Streep reading it. And I had bought the audiobook because of a bit of insomnia, I think, you know, I'll soothe myself to sleep. No, I was lying awake for three <laughs> hours in order to listen to Meryl Streep. So listen to it by day because you will not want to fall asleep. 